many of the kids that we've seen have told us that uh, their symptoms started or were exacerbated after watching videos on TikTok of people uh, who were promoting self-advocacy or community advocacy for Tourette syndrome. There are millions of uh, of followers of popular social media accounts of patients with similar tick-like behaviors uh, on TikTok, uh, YouTube, for example. And what we're seeing in the clinic, uh, the manifestations are very similar to what what um, can be seen in these videos. There's been a lot of commonalities in the different ticks we're seeing between people and uh, also between centers. So, you know, the ticks that my colleagues are seeing in, in London and in Australia are very similar to the ticks that we're seeing in Canada and in the U.S. Um, so this suggests sort of a common disease model. We're not sure why this is happening. Uh, we are tr investigating this phenomenon. Uh, we think that it is potentially related to the increase in social media use uh, during the pandemic. Many of the young people we are seeing have comorbid uh, neurodevelopmental disorders or neuropsychiatric disorders, suggesting that there may be uh, an inherent susceptibility to the development of ticks. People with tick disorders are susceptible to something called echo phenomena. And we see this, for example, uh, at meetings, uh, the support group meetings, that sometimes if one person in the support group has a certain tick uh, and the tick is, is done over the course of the meeting, that another person in the group will also have developed the same tick. And so we're wondering if it's some type of echo phenomena that's going on. We don't know if uh, the chronic stress of the pandemic and the social isolation that people are experiencing are making them more susceptible to, to develop a tick disorder. We also think that it's possible that these, uh, that the pandemic and the stress associated with it has resulted in the development of, of functional neurological symptoms. Um, and that these tick-like behaviors that people are seeing in social media are serving as the disease model. We very much want to help these people. Uh, and um, because, you know, I've spoken with so many distressed parents, uh, distressed teens and young adults uh, who are incapacitated by these symptoms. And because these symptoms are so different from what we are used to seeing in, in our clinic, we don't know the best way to help these people. Our gut instinct is that, uh, is that the comprehensive behavioral intervention for ticks uh, is the most logical uh, choice uh, to manage these tick-like behaviors. Uh, certainly um, with an emphasis on functional interventions to minimize triggers for ticks and any responses to ticks which may perpetuate and reinforce the tick-like behaviors. So, you know, I'm asking all my patients now uh, if they're on social media and if they're watching these videos, they all say yes. They're all watching the videos. And when I ask them, do you think that, you know, that this is a trigger for you? Uh, again, many of them say that they know that their ticks are worse after watching these videos. So, you know, I've been really encouraging them to limit their uh, exposure to these videos. And it's understandable why, why people want to connect with others during this time. Opportunities for socialization for young people have become so limited during the pandemic. Uh, and I know that people want to connect with, with other people. They want to connect with people who understand what they're going through. Um, but I, I, I say to them that perhaps that since you know this makes your symptoms worse. This would be something that uh, that you should avoid at least until you know until things have have settled a bit for yourself. That this could be helpful. 
And then, so that would be the functional intervention, avoiding triggers. And then the comprehensive behavioral intervention for ticks uh, teaches people to pay attention to the urges that they experience prior to their ticks. Uh, and that when they get this urge to suppress their ticks. Um, so that's typically using what's called a competing response. It's something that's incompatible with the tick. And you perform that competing response until the urge to produce the tick dissipates. There's no reason why this type of treatment, which we use in Tourette syndrome, should not be effective for people with tick-like behaviors as well. Many of the people that we're seeing with these tick-like behaviors have anxiety disorders and mood disorders. And so we're really uh, emphasizing treatment of the anxiety and mood disorder with the hopes that if we address those things, that the ticks will improve. We, we see this with, with, in, with, tick disorders as well. So in people with Tourette syndrome, anxiety can fuel the ticks as well as can, as well as uh, mood problems can fuel ticks. So if we pay attention to trying to manage these co-occurring symptoms, we would expect the ticks to improve as well. I feel like we're dealing with a, a new, a new disorder. Um, and so, uh, I have seen people who uh, whose ticks started suddenly and stopped suddenly. I have seen that. Um, in some of the cases, uh, they've been started on on medication for ticks, uh, and within days, their ticks have gone away. And um, we wouldn't expect such a quick response typically, um, suggesting that maybe this is a placebo effect. You know, when well, that's certainly what not what we would expect. Usually our our medications work through sort of long term neuromodulation as opposed to having a quick a quick effect. So I think it's quite possible that in some people uh, we will have quick resolution of symptoms. Uh, in other cases, I, I think I, I'm just not sure. I think that's why I think it's really, really important that we see these uh, individuals who have these symptoms, that we uh, have an in-depth discussion of what the symptoms are uh, and, uh, and reinforce the need for the, for the psychological behavioral therapies uh, to address them.